Okay, so we're on to actually achieving an intubation for the difficult patient, the difficult airway, all right? And first and foremost, I'd like to tell you that this video is just as important for EMTs as it is for paramedics. And the reason I say that is some of these little tips and tricks, unless you had them from the beginning and you're new, the, trip, the, t the tips and tricks that you are gonna see, you're actually gonna remember them, but it's gonna be remembered after the call and not during the call what's in it, when it's important because you're just not used to practicing them. And I think that the EMTs are gonna be important at this point because they're gonna be the ones to, to say, oh, remember that one trick? Do you want me to try this or let me help you with that? And so again, it's very important for everyone to, to be able to see this video and view this video. And even though it has to do with the, you know, dropping a tube, that doesn't mean EMTs are excluded. So first and foremost, if I'm going to RSI or crash intubate anyone, please remember that you have your backups. You know, we've got a king tube. We just started carrying the eye gels. Have an eye gel out as well if you have that available. Um, <clears throat> make sure you have your suction. Make sure you have your adjuncts and God forbid a scalpel <laughs> if you need it. Now talk about adjuncts. If, and this is probably more for the, the, the BLS airway administration, but we've always been told do an OPA or an NPA, okay? If you can accept an OPA and you don't have a secondary oxygen source to be able to put the nasal cannula on at 15 liters, put not one, but two NPAs in plus the OPA. It actually achieves a, a better airflow for the patient, okay? Now, when it gets down to the intubation portion, it's important that we don't just go in, look, and go, ah, I don't see anything, hand me the king tube. And the reason is you start losing your skill. And if you lose your skill, there's a certain degree of patience out there that cannot accept a supraglottic airway. So it's important that you still have strong skills at intubation and don't be lazy and just go for a supraglottic airway. Because if you end up having a patient with severe, anaphy or a severe allergic reaction or anaphylaxis, if you have somebody with airway swelling, <clears throat> such as from you know, inhalation injury or burns, if you have any other reason why your trachea would be swelling shut, then this does you zero good. So you have to remember how to intubate and do it well. Please don't become complacent. Please don't become lazy. Okay, first and foremost, let's just put the blade down and talk about this. The secret to getting a difficult intubation on a patient that maybe has a, too large of a tongue, has a, you know, a very thick, no neck, can't move, all that kind of good stuff, is line of sight. And we forget line of sight is the most important thing because this tool, it has two jobs. Job number one is to displace the jaw a little bit. Job number two is to control the tongue. Well, this means nothing. And I think we put too much emphasis on just this tool and not as much emphasis on the positioning of the patient and positioning of yourself. Because if I don't have good line of sight, this will not help me. Case in point. I pull the patient forward and I let their head flop all the way back. Now if you can draw an imaginary line from my eye to where the back of, what am I looking at? I'm looking at the uvula. I'm looking at the back of the throat. That's not where the cords are guys. The cords are up here. So by having the head flipped all the way down like it's falling over a, roll, uh, over a cliff, that doesn't help me. Now some people will say, well yeah, you know, we'll grab the hands, we'll pull the hands up, we'll get the head to flop back. Yes, but by the time you actually achieve a good sight line, you're actually lifting and the head is where? Parallel with the ceiling, okay? The, <clears throat> some of you may understand this, some of you won't, but the one knee between captain's chair and stretcher intubation maneuver needs to go away, okay? Make it easy for yourself. If I have the patient on the stretcher, I wanna elevate it 30 degrees, I wanna bring the patient towards me, and instead of letting the head flop all the way back, I want to place it here, even if I have to take something like this to secure it. But the best thing to do is, if I have the face parallel with the ceiling, not a church ceiling, <laughs> your box ceiling, all right? Now, where's my line of sight if I'm sitting here? It's looking directly to where I need to see. Now I use this piece of equipment to pretty much manipulate the jaw out of the way and move the tongue. And that's all I have to do. And the best part about this, not the best part, but one of the great parts about this is it almost prevents you from rocking. Those of you who have a bad habit of still rocking, you actually don't even have to lift up at this point. You just go towards the feet, which makes it easier for you. 
okay? Talk about if you're not in the back of the truck and you're not on the stretcher and you say, well, that's great, man. But 